and now I'd like to welcome Tor Sadia, uh, who works as an uh, inclusive design architect at the Bureau Happold in uh, London. And you will take this uh, another step further, and the stage is yours. Thank you. So I'm really excited to be here and speak to you about my research on exploring the design preferences of neurodivergent populations for quiet spaces. So as you can see, I'm not an acoustician in my background, uh, so I thought it might be helpful to explain a little bit about what is inclusive design and what it is that I do. Um, so essentially, we think about the design from the perspective of the person and what are their needs. And of course, there's a wide diversity of needs. Um, so we try to put on lenses and think about the journey um, of the person who will experience the space and see if there are any barriers, if there are any challenges, and if there is, um, on the other side, anything that can help them thrive better in that environment. Um, so I'm a senior inclusive design consultant at Barrier Happold. I'm a lecturer on designing inclusive places in uh, University College London, uh, an architect, and I have an MSc in health, well-being, and sustainable buildings. So just to kind of, uh, a few people have already spoken about neurodiversity, but just to make sure we're all aligned on what this means. Um, essentially, it's the recognition that we all have unique brains, um, which also means that we all have unique uh, neurocognitive profiles. Uh, we're all different in the way we think, in the way we learn, in the way we communicate, and how we navigate, and how we experience the world through our senses. So just a little bit about terminology. When we're talking about neurodiversity, we're talking about the diversity of all of us. So neurodiverse is all of us. Neurotypical is someone who has a more of a typical neurological development and cognitive function. Um, so more around the, the average. And neurodivergent is different from the neurotypical profile, which may be um, a bit lower in some areas and higher in some other areas. When we speak about neurodiversity, we go beyond the diagnosis and we look at it more um, as a continuum. So we appreciate people and include uh, populations who do not have a formal diagnosis, um, people who may have neurodivergent traits which do not fit the normal, uh, the formal diagnosis uh, category, uh, people who are mainly neurotypical with some neurodivergent traits and people who have several neurodivergent conditions. So um, while we look at, at people who may have uh, special needs and may have a diagnosis, we also look at everyone and all of their needs and this is a lens that helps us to understand um, the diversity of people's needs. So my research focused um, on, uh, actually included uh, various design aspects but um, in this talk, I will try to focus on the, um, more of the acoustics and sound aspects um, for this presentation. So um, in terms of a literature review, it might help to understand, and the previous um, uh, presentation has touched on this a little bit as well, uh, that one sense may occupy someone's full attention. So it may be difficult for someone to um, get signals from their other senses. There may be interferences between uh, within one sense, such as a difficulty of distinguishing between background and foreground sounds. There may be an experience of extreme amplification of sound, and there may be intolerance to particular sounds or frequencies. Um, so research, research has shown that background noise, sound infiltration, echoes, and reverberation have a negative impact on concentration and behavior of students with ASD and or ADHD. And on the other side, the reduction of echo and external noise improve behavioral temperament, mood, comfort, attention, performance, attendance, and engagement of students with ASD or dyspraxia. So what are quiet spaces? Uh, a quiet space provides a calm environment where people can find relief from stress and sensory overload. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, silent, but rather creates a mentally quiet environment which promotes relaxation. So there might, you might find um, that there are other terminologies for this type of space, such as restorative spaces. So they all allude to the same um, thing. And um, as quiet, since quiet space is uh, meant to find relief from stress uh, and sensory overload, um, s sensory overload is a condition in which sensory stimuli are received at an excessive rate or intensity. 
It can produce increases in heart rate, in breathing, in blood pressure, in confusion, anxiety, mental distress, and or erratic behavior. So a lot of physical um, and mental um, ill health uh, with sensory overload. And research shows that neurodivergent populations are more susceptible to experiencing sensory overload. So when we're designing for neurodiversity, we're mainly focusing on sensory processing differences and information processing differences. Um, and in this research, I'm focusing more on sensory processing differences and how to um, help overcome sensory overload by designing quiet spaces. So my research included uh, two research methods. One was an, uh, a global online survey, which was administered in three languages. And another is uh, semi-structured interviews with professionals in the field. I focused on six design features, sound, lighting, space layout, color, furniture, and decoration. The survey uh, had three different parts. The first one um, asked about impressions from a previous experience in a quiet space. Uh, part two uh, asked about what is the ideal quiet space? And part three asked um, to get perceptions on quiet spaces as are shown in the images. So some background information on the survey results. There were 336 responses, out of which 312 met the inclusion criteria for data analysis. Uh, there was quite a range in the age of the respondents, and there were respondents from all of uh, the different continents. So an important thing that I was trying to understand through the research is what helps somebody feel calm? And are there different design preferences? And why are there different design pr preferences? And I try to understand what is the reason that people might prefer something different, and if this is something that we can predict as well. So I looked at people's uh, specific neurodivergent conditions and tried to see if there was a correlation with that and the design preferences or whether the frequency in which they experienced sensory overload um, had a, a correlation with what they preferred. And what the research showed was that the frequency of sensory overload, which the assumption is that that's an indicator of whether they had a more hypersensitive uh, sensory profile versus a hyposensitive sensory profile, uh, was a predictor of what their design preferences would be. Uh, in terms of the importance rating of, um, of the design features, sound was the, actually the most important one, um, followed by lighting. And the importance of sound as a design feature um, and lighting as well increased with a high, hypersensitivity. So when you look at the charts, if it increases towards the left, it's uh, associated with hypersensitivity. If it increases towards the right, then it's associated with hyposensitivity. In terms of the importance of implementing quiet spaces in uh, different locations, uh, education was the most important one, uh, followed by workplaces, healthcare, and transportation. And now we'll get into the survey results. So the first part was conditional on somebody having had an experience in a quiet space. So there are a, a li less uh, respondents for this section, but I thought it was interesting that um, mainly the uh, uh, sun levels which w were appreciated were relatively low, but not completely silent. That people um, both appreciated or found the main sources of sound bothersome, so there was a uh, difference in op of opinions on this, as well as musical qualities. But I thought it was also interesting that nature sounds were mostly found to be bothersome. So it looks like um, how the nature sounds were implemented in existing quiet spaces was not found to be successful. Uh, in terms of preferred soundscapes, no sound was the most preferred soundscape, followed by nature and music. And what you can see is that there is a correlation between the choice of no, no sound and hypersensitivity, and there's a correlation between the choice of music and hyposensitivity, wanting increased stimulation. Um, in terms of the preferred sound of nature, uh, sounds of water were the most preferred, so water, rain, and ocean waves. And preferred music qualities were soft, instrumental, and slow. So as I mentioned, um, 
if, if you look on these charts, n a negative number is for high post sensitivity, so someone who may want increased stimulation, and um, positive numbers are for hypersensitivity, somebody who may be over responsive to sensory stimuli. So um, no sound, as I said, uh, was associated with hypersensitivity, while music with hyposensitivity. Uh, water sounds, um, deep ocean sounds, and ocean waves were associated with hyposensitivity. The choice of slow instrumental music was associated with hypersensitivity and vocal with hyposensitivity. From the interviews, I got some additional insights uh, regarding sound. Um, and I thought it was really interesting uh, that it was advisable to avoid simulated monotone or repetitive nature sounds, which may be perceived as intoler uh, intolerable. And I think that's very interesting um, because it kind of alludes to fake biophilia, <laughs> if you may. So kind of like if you think a plant is real and you touch it and it's actually plastic, I think sometimes that harm can be... Um, more harmful than helpful uh, for some people, uh, and also patterns that are not uh, natural. Some people may be more um, sensitive and may be able to recognize that the patterns are not natural, and that may be more difficult for them to be in that kind of environment. Um, some more uh, perhaps predictable things are uh, it's crucial to have good acoustics, considering that neurodivergent populations may be more sensitive to hearing echoes and it's important to integrate soft materials for sound absorption. Um, I'll touch upon the other design aspects as well, but kind of quickly. Um, so in terms of lighting levels, there was a preference to dimmer, but not completely dim environments. Um, in terms of preferred correlated color temperature, there was a preference around 3000 Kelvin, so warmer um, lighting. Although you can see that that preference uh, is correlated with, um, so warmer colors was, uh, the choice of warmer colors was associated with hypersensitivity, while the choice of cooler colors was associated with hyposensitivity. Um, and from the people who thought that colored lighting should be incorporated, uh, blue was the preferred color, uh, which I think may be related to um, a psychological feeling of cool. Uh, where when you're experiencing sensory overload, you may feel that your body temperature is rising. In terms of preferred space layout, uh, simple, private, informal, and cozy were the preferred uh, space layouts. Uh, preferred walls were colored, textured, and white um, from natural materials, muted colors, and keeping it to only a few colors in the color scheme. The most important furniture qualities were comfort, <laughs> texture, and uh, materials were fabric and wood, so you can see that this points back to kind of biophilic elements. Um, and various items that were preferred in the white space, uh, such as chairs, pillows, bean bags. Um, in terms of preferred elements for decoration, plants were by far the most preferred, both for all neurodivergent and sensory overload frequency groups, uh, again, uh, related to biophilia, uh, followed by images. And in the images, nature was, again, the most preferred um, choice. This is uh, the quiet space A. This is in part three of the survey. So you can see that the relaxation rating of Quiet Space A was kind of average. Um, but what I thought was really interesting about these ones is that you'll see that some of the same things are repeating in the liked section and in the disliked section. And I think that really shows that people have different preferences. Um, so for example, in this case, you can see that objects were both liked and disliked. So um, that might depend on the person's sensory profile. This is Quiet Space B. This, uh, the relaxation rating was a little bit higher. Um, and you can see that the lighting was both liked and disliked. And uh, everybody agreed that the furniture was uh, something that was not very successful in this space. This is quite space C. So the relaxation rating of this was, again, around average. And you can see here that the furniture and the space layout were not uh, we're, we're both, sorry, we're both liked and disliked. 
but everybody seemed to uh, not find the space layout very favorable. So I think something that really interesting that came out of this is that you can see that um, in the last question of the survey, which asked if there was a quiet space which fully met the person's sensory needs, um, the responses were really diverse, both between the three quiet spaces and none of the above. So you can see that there wasn't an agreement between the respondents on one solution that met everybody's needs. So I'm just coming to the conclusion of the survey results. So this is a summary of all the different correlations that I found between uh, the sensory profile and people's design preferences. Uh, I found that there were some things that all neurodivergent and sensory overload frequency groups agreed upon, uh, and some of these alluded to biophilia. Uh, something really interesting that came out of the survey is the importance of providing variety, flexibility, and control in environment. And I think this is specifically important for a quiet space, but I think this is actually something that is really important for inclusive spaces in general to uh, because people have different needs and they may need to adjust the environment to meet their needs. And also it's empowering for people to feel that they can control to their environment to meet their needs. Uh, and in this chart, I'm showing how you can do that for the different design aspects of the space. So for instance, um, in terms of sound, you can provide optional sounds on an individual basis. Uh, this chart kind of concludes the findings uh, from the research. Uh, so, um, on the left side, you can see uh, the design aspects for hypersensitivity and on the right side for hyposensitivity. And the general recommendation is to create a baseline design that is more neutral and passive for hypersensitivity with optional additions by choice that can respond to the needs of hyposensitive individuals. And yeah, I'm coming towards the end. <laughs> Uh, so in terms of future research, uh, I think it would be interesting to investigate the role of biophilia in acoustics, uh, more specifically, how this may relate to the experience of people with neurodivergent conditions and how findings may impact the design of quiet spaces. Um, testing the study results in a physical experiment with physiological data, um, including additional design features such as olfaction and thermal comfort, and investigating the design preferences of additional populations which may be susceptible to sensory overload, such as people uh, who suffer from migraines, generalized anxiety disorder, or uh, PTSD. And that's around the end. Uh, <laughs> the, this research has been featured in the Venice uh, Architecture Biennale, and it's featured in the British Standards Institute's Past 6463 Design for the Mind, uh, which is a guide on how to design for neurodiversity in the built environment which is publicly available, and uh, my research is also publicly available at the preprint link that you can see here. Um, and this is all, thank you very much. Right, thank you very much. A lot to think about when you're an architect and an acoustician, of course. <laughs>